Nicola and I want to welcome you to our podcast today. I hope it inspires you, challenges you, builds you and motivates you to live the life that God has for you. Enjoy the message. Amazing. You guys can all take your seats. I'm just going to do a little test. We're going to stick with the handheld. (laughs) Good morning. Oh, well, it's so good to be with you today, church. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to be opening the word of God with you this morning. Pastor Phil and Claire are away. They are in uh, Salford. Pastor Phil is preaching at Salford, um, but they wanted to make sure that they say hello. They miss you, and uh, and they will be back with us next week. Is there any chance I can get a little bit of house lights? I feel like proper when I say that. That's the type of thing you hear Pastor Derek say, isn't it? A little bit of house lights. Um, And then I can see your lovely faces. Uh, I don't know about you, but over summer, I have ha- absolutely just loved connecting with people more. I've had the privilege of being able to serve on the holiday club, uh, but we've had so much going like we've had worship Wednesdays. Anyone been to one of our worship nights? They have just been so, so good. Um, We've had loads of different things going on. We've been able to open the community building afterwards. And it's just been great to be finally back connecting together, not over Zoom, though we are blessed to still have Zoom and be able to connect um, because of that. But has anyone found that they have lost the ability to do small talk whilst in COVID? (laughs) Anyone? Anyone just never had the ability to to do small talk anyway? Oh gosh, that's worrying as a church. I'm going to teach you. Don't worry because I do not have that problem. I am a talker by nature. In fact, my husband likens me to um, a child's toy, which actually I'm just going to show you. If you just pass me, this is what my husband said. He he was trying, babe, just, I can't describe you. He said, actually, I've, I've got it. You're like one of these. It's chattering teeth. Anyone remember chattering teeth? And he says, I don't even need to wind you up. I literally just need to say, how has your day been? And that is it. I am like off and I am chattering away and I just do not stop. In fact, I am that bad. I am officially a till talker. Anyone else a till talker in this place? You know the till talkers. If you don't like till talkers, you often get stuck behind a till talker. And when they're going through getting their stuff scanned, they like go on to continue to say every item that they bought, what it was for, maybe what your day's been like. We even go there with what shift are you working? I know, I know, it's so embarrassing, but this just happens and we just cannot stop talking. It's like a disease. I just can't stop it. It's definitely an illness. Um, So I do not have a problem with talking. In fact, there's only been a few times in my life that I have been rendered speechless. One of those times was um, when we'd had Harrison already, we had our first son and we found out we was pregnant again and uh, and so Steve, my husband, he was actually working um, when we had the scan book so he said look don't worry just you go for this one I'm going to try and book the next one off um, when we can hopefully find out what it is and so go on this one just phone me straight after so I was like okay no problem took my mum my mum wasn't allowed into uh, the place where we had the scan so she waited in the waiting room and I knew that it was taking a little bit longer for the scans to go ahead but I thought it's all right I'll just chat away so I'm just chatting away to this woman and I could really tell that she was getting annoyed at me she was trying to do a measuring but I just thought I can't help it and until eventually she turned around the screen and she said well Christina it looks like you're having two and I was rendered speechless (laughs) I literally I remember I was laid down and I remember sitting up going back down like what what? How? I don't understand. Like, when? Like, what? Are you? I was honestly rendered speechless. And if you thought my face was bad, you should have seen Steve's face afterwards. <laughs> Whiter than white. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and the second time that I was rendered speechless was actually just a couple of weeks ago. You're going to absolutely love this headline. The headline was. Tina and Steve invited for a night round to the pastor's house to play Scrabble. 
Like you couldn't get more Christian than that, could you? We were going around to the pastor's house to play Scrabble. We went round to Ian and Joe's uh, with Pastor Phil and Claire Harrison. And we decided to play Scrabble. Have you ever done it where you make your own little board in front of you? And then you go in against each other in pairs. I think it's called a different game. Bananagrams, there you go, order that one, it's a cracking game off Amazon, I'm sure other places do it. And, uh, and so we was playing this game and my son Harrison uh, said he would go with Pastor Claire. So I was like, no problem, I'm thinking my son's pretty bright. So I'm like, yeah, you go and show off your skills, go and show them how clever you are, son. Do some good spelling words. And uh, we sat across the table, you know me, I'm in game mode, so I'm like concentrating. And then I hear Pastor Claire say, oh, Harrison, I don't think we should spell that word. <laughs> and I literally was looking up at him, glaring, thinking, what on earth has he spelled out? So I'm trying to stay like composed. It's all right, you know, Pastor Claire's going to deal with this one. We're, we're raising children together. It takes a village. Don't worry, Tina, stay chilled. And so we carry on playing. And then the game had finished, and I thought, I just can't. I can't not go and ask. I went and asked Pastor Claire what my son said. And I can tell you, church, I will not be repeating the word that he had spelled out. I don't even, in my, in my categories, I don't even classify it as a swear word. I class it as a vile, vulgar word. But when I asked him about it, don't worry, he said he'd heard it from Pastor Derek, so we're clear. <laughs> it's not us. It's not in our family. Um, but there's only been a few times that I've been rendered speechless. Um, but one of the times that um, I, I did, I was really speechless, was I became a Christian at 14. Been going to the youth group from when I was 13 uh, because I found a few fit lads, uh, a few fit lads there. That was the honest truth, and I, I managed to marry one of them, so did all right at that one. <laughs> and I've been going for a year, and then finally at 14, I decided to give my life to God, and God absolutely transformed my life. He really did turn it upside down, but the journey just didn't come really easily. I, I really desperately wanted to go on this journey of prayer. Um, I'd heard other people pray, but I didn't quite know how to do it. And I remember taking myself into my bedroom as a 14-year-old girl, and I closed the door behind me, and I sat on my bed, and my prayer went a little bit like this. So, God, this is weird. kind of don't know what to say, but I, I want to pray, so Amen. There we go. And genuinely, I kid you not, that is how my first prayer went. I was speechless. I didn't know what to say. And, um, and there, are, there are times in our life when we are rendered speechless. But I want to speak about this morning. We're continuing with our series called Words and Warfare about the power of our prayer. The power of our prayer. And that is not something that we should grow silent about as a church. And uh, I know that in this room right now, now there will be different perspectives uh, on prayer maybe some experiences that you've had maybe stuff that people have told you and and some of us maybe in this room see prayer like a call to the emergency services and maybe for you it's that you um, just call them up when, whenever you need God for something and you're desperate and that's maybe for you a time when you turn to God but on the whole the majority of your life you don't really need prayer and you don't rely on your prayer in your everyday situations. Noah's following me with some images behind and uh, there it is. It's for the kids. And, uh, and maybe in this room maybe you uh, see prayer this morning like a running tap. And you're trying to turn the tap on and, you, and you're trying and you're thinking, okay, God, I'm giving this a go. But actually you see the sink as having no plug in it at all. And you just feel like it's just an absolute pointless exercise because you feel like it's going nowhere. Maybe that's you this morning. Or maybe in this room, maybe there's some people that see like you're going to a shop to go and do a transaction and you're going trying to hand something over of you, but then depending on what you get in return is depending on whether you feel like that was good enough, was it what I wanted, and that maybe is dependent on whether you actually go back again and you try prayer again. Maybe you go and try something different. But this morning, I want us to help us to see prayer actually as words of warfare, 
That is what I want every single one of us to leave this building on this morning because you might have been a Christian for a while, but I believe God wants to renew your mind this morning on the purpose of prayer. And we've heard it already through Pastor Adam and we've heard it already through Jo sharing about her situation with John that there is power in prayer and we need to be using the weapon that God has given us to fight things that we cannot see. And so this morning I want us to see prayer as words of warfare. We're going to continue um, looking at the life of Hannah. If you missed last week, then uh, Pastor Claire kicked us off and she told us about the beginning of the story that's found in 1 Samuel. I'm going to read it. It should come on the screen. If you've got your Bible, you can turn um, to it with me. 1 Samuel. And she talked us through the beginning, uh, beginning of the story where Elkanah had two wives and he had Peniah and he had Hannah. And with Peniah, he had two children. But with Hannah, she was barren and she couldn't have children. And they tried and they'd prayed and, and she was absolutely distraught. And Peniah, last week's message, it's great. If you missed it, make sure you catch up. Peniah used to taunt Hannah and she used to throw awful words at her. And we spoke about the power of your words being to build somebody up or to absolutely tear somebody down. And Claire was encouraging us as a church, let us be people that build people up in faith with our words. But we're going to continue to read the story this morning from verse 10 through to 18. And we're going to look at how Hannah used her words of prayer for words of warfare. So let's read that together from 10 through to 18. It says, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if only you will look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I am praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. She went on a journey of prayer through her situation. And this morning, by a miracle, we are going to get through five things that we can learn from the prayer of Hannah. And I genuinely have been praying for every single person that would be in this building this morning, that you would be renewed in your mindset of prayer. And I really pray that one of these points, one of the things that we can learn will be good for you and just renew you in your spirit and renew you in your journey of prayer this morning. So um, I'm going to read verse 10 again. Verse 10, and it says, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And the first thing that I want us to uh, focus on about Hannah's prayer is about painful prayer. Painful prayer, which I guess is kind of what, what we've been looking at this morning. Situations that you can just think, oh my goodness, I actually... I'm so hurt and I'm so feeling loads of pain this morning that I almost don't know what to do. But Hannah took it to God in prayer. You know, just two weeks ago, we was at um, the first worship night and uh, I'd already arrived and I was in the middle and we was, uh, we was around in a circle and I was worshipping and my friend had arrived late. She was coming from work. Um, and I, I kind of felt, you know, you feel somebody on your shoulder. And so I kind of turned and I, and I followed her through. And as I looked at her face, 
I realized she was absolutely distraught. Something had happened. She looked heartbroken. And I'd said, what on earth has happened? What is wrong? And she'd said she'd left work and she'd driven through town and she had seen something that had broken her heart in the middle of town. And in fact, she'd seen some of our young people that we have known come through the doors of youth that were in the middle of this situation in town. And she tried to help and she tried to get involved, but she couldn't do anything. And so she just carried on driving and she came here to church and she was just a mess. And she was like, I just feel like I can't go in to worship. I feel like it's just, I need to get back out there. I feel like I need to go and do something. And we continued to talk and what we spoke about was about those moments when you are just in such a messy situation that your, your body almost kicks into the way that it's been created to you, your adrenaline rushes and you go into this independent mode where if you're anything like me, you just want to fix the situation. You just want to do anything that you can. I'm just going to control every element of this situation. I, I'm going to do what I can do here. I'm going to get people to do what they can do here. I'm just going to do the best that I can. That actually we are in danger as God's people of going too independent that we're moving ourselves away from the power of God. Actually, prayer can become a last resort instead of being a first resort. And so this is a word for somebody this morning in this place, that we would be a church that when we are going through painful situations, we would go to prayer first and foremost because we know that God is far more powerful than we are. We don't even need to go into independent mode before we go to God and his spirit because he can do far more than we ever can. I want to just read a quote to you from this incredible book. If you're a parent, I really encourage you to read this book. It's called Praying Circles Around the Lives of Your Children by Mark Batterson. And there's a quote in this book that I want to read. And it says, prayer is your highest privilege as a parent. Don't just leverage it as a last resort when everything else fails, but make it your first priority. Nothing you can do will give you a higher return on your investment and the dividends are both generational and eternal. Listen to that bit, church. Nothing you can do will give you a higher return on your investment. We should be a people that are saying, we want to do all we can. We want to be God's hand and feet and I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to run the holiday club. We're going to open the grocery store. We're going to do all this. But get me to the place of prayer first and foremost because God can do far more than I possibly can. You know, the Bible says it, doesn't it? It says it in Zechariah 4 verse 6. It says, it's not by might and it's not by our our power but it's by the Holy Spirit that we are going to get miracles. Luke 18 verse 27 says Jesus replied what is impossible with man is possible with God and I just want to speak to anyone in this place this morning that maybe is going through a painful situation to remind you in your spirit that you need to go to God with everything in you. Run to God in your pain, just like Hannah did, and use your words of warfare right there. Okay, we're moving on to the next verse. The next verse in verse 11, and it says, And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if only you will look on your servant's misery and remember me, not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. The next thing I think we can learn from the way Hannah prayed was about promised prayer. Promised prayer. You see, what we've just read between Hannah and God was actually what she was doing is she was she was standing on the promise of God and she was saying, remember me. It was said so much in the Bible. Remember me, oh God. And then she was giving a promise back to, back to him. And then I will commit him to you all the days of your life. And there's something beautiful that goes on in this relationship in prayer between promise prayer where you stand on the promises of God and you can Commit promises to him yourself. I am um, about a month ago was at youth 
on a Friday and there was a girl that had come over and she said, can I have a minute with you? And I said, yeah. And she began to tell me about a situation that she'd sat on for a month and not told anybody about this situation. Something had happened between her and a friend and it was just awful, honestly. It was awful what had, what had gone on. And she had tried everything in her power to try and change the situation. She'd stayed bold in her faith. She'd stayed faithful to God. And she just, she was at the end of herself. I, I don't know what to do. And I kind of had nothing left to say. She'd handled it so wisely then. Let's just pray together. Let's pray together. And we began to pray this prayer where we stood on the word of God together. And we actually prayed that verse that I just shared about let this not be by might or by power of what she can do but let a miracle happen by your spirit we prayed the promise of God and then we prayed back to that the promise of her that as she continues to do what is right and as she continues to be bold in her faith and there was this beautiful thing that happened with promised prayer and maybe that is something for you in your situation that you know I need to do that a little bit more I need to pray the promises of God I need to pray promises myself back to God and that was on the Friday Saturday went Sunday came here and I got out of my car and the first person that I seen in the car park on my way in was this girl and she shouted me over and I said morning you okay just thinking she's saying morning she was like no no Tina she texts me and my mouth literally dropped and hit the floor. What? She texts me and she apologized totally out of the blue. I've not texted her. I've not been in touch. I've not done anything. But she knew in that moment that the power of God had moved from her praying on Friday, that the Spirit had done a miraculous work in her life and that raised her faith. And discipleship went on for her in that moment where she'd stood on the promise and then she knew God is faithful. And I know that she will go into more situations from there filled with faith. And just a couple of verses I want to share on this. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Guys, get this. For no matter how many promises in the word, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. The promises of Christ are yes and amen. And if we believe that, we would be praying that so much more. Another incredible thing that Mark Batterson says in this book here is he says, my greatest joy is knowing that I have prayed every word of God, every promise of God with my son in mind. If you don't know where to begin this morning in prayer, I encourage you to get to know the word, stand on the word, pray the word, declare the word over your family. It is not a dripping tap. It is not wasted words. The investment is generational and eternal. Let's be a people that pray the word of God. Okay, we're continuing. Uh, moving forward, so the next verse, and um, this one, verse 12, and it says, As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. As she kept on praying to the Lord. The third thing that I think we can take and be encouraged by in Hannah's story is about persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. And I just thought for this, I wanted to share with you about a story that I am still being persistent with because sometimes it's quite easy to hear people that have got to their miracle at the end of persistent prayer and, and it can and it absolutely does encourage you. But the really reality and the truth is that many times we are left in situations where we are still having to persist. I am now 34, I know, shock, you would not believe it at all, 34, I became a Christian at 14, so fast maths, I've been a Christian for 20 years. For 20 years, I have been praying for the salvation of my family, for 20 years. And I am going to be so honest with you, for every passing year that goes by, my faith is challenged more and more because my family are getting older. They're getting more and more stubborn and set in their ways, as you do with age, not looking at anyone. <laughs> 
And I, and I, I can't help it. I, I have a battle with my flesh and with my spirit because with my flesh, I don't see how there's ever going to be a day where they give their lives to God. But I have to be persistent in my prayer and I have to strengthen my faith that when I don't see it with my eyes through faith, I am encouraged that God will work a miracle. And so maybe you're in this building this morning. And you're in a situation, maybe like I am, something that you just think I'm trying my utter hardest to stand on prayer. And I have been persistent, but I am getting so weary. Maybe there is a sense of weariness of waiting for a change. A sense of weariness of waiting for that answer this morning. But I can only encourage you with the word of God this morning. And I'm going to take you to Ephesians, um, to the armor of God this morning. Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 18. And it says, and pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and keep on praying. When God talks to us through the Bible about the armor that we should put on in our life when we're facing battles, it tells us to keep on praying. The battles in our life are persistent and therefore our prayers need to continue to be persistent. Ephesians 6 verse 13 says this, therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And this is the really important bit. And after you have done everything, comma, to stand, to continue to stand. I really believe that this is a word for somebody this morning, that you just feel like you have done everything everything you can possibly do. You feel like I've stood, I've been persistent, but the Bible says to us this morning, after you have done everything, continue to stand. I believe God has not called us to understand but he's just called us to stand. And for anyone that's going through a situation this morning that you do not understand and you cannot see it just like I can, I want to encourage you to be strengthened in your faith and to continue to persist and pray this morning. Okay, the next thing, verse 13. It says, Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. She was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice could not be heard because this beautiful thing was going on called private prayer. Private prayer. And there's nobody greater that I can take you to. No greater life that's ever been lived than that by the life of Jesus. You know, I was reading over the Gospels and all four of the Gospels and it struck me to find that Jesus by role model shows us that the majority of his prayer life he spent in private prayer. And if Jesus needed to do that, how much more do we need to do that? He did that by role model. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house and he went to a solitary place where he prayed. He took himself away from everyone and there he got on his knees before his father and he prayed and that is the power of private prayer. He showed us through his role model, the one that we're trying to be like showed us the power of private prayer. But in Matthew 6, verse 66 he doesn't just show us but he also teaches us he says but when you pray go into your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you not only does he show us with the life that he lived through his role model about the importance of private prayer, but he also teaches us it through his word that he spoke to the disciples. It's now in the Bible. It's important that we prioritize private prayer. I honestly believe that private prayer is almost your most realist, truest, most sincere most humble form of prayer that you will ever find. When nobody else is there, but it is just you 
on your knees before your father, no show going on, nothing there to distract us, nothing there where we might slip into a danger of, of a performance, but just you there before God being humble and transparent and vulnerable and sincere and pure. And I pray that Every Christian in this place would be a person that is passionate about private prayer. It is there that your relationship with God will truly grow. Maybe in this place you're thinking, I want to grow in my relationship with God, but I don't know how to do it. Let you be encouraged this morning from the life of Hannah to prioritize private prayer. Private prayer. Okay, and the last thing that I'm going to um, share with you this morning is, um, is then the rest of, of the chapter. We've been going line by line, uh, but this one is a few at a time. And it says this, okay, verse 14, well, Eli thought she was drunk. Then verse 14, and he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. But she says, verse 15, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. And she said, may the servant find favor in your eyes. And she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And the final thing that I wanted us to look at this morning was about the power of public prayer. Public prayer. There was a girl that was 13 years old and um, she was a Christian. She grew up in a Christian family and she was invited um, with another family to go and do a Bible study once a week. And so these families with the, all the siblings that were in, they would meet in this house once a week to open God's word together. And uh, one, one week the lady who was running it had said, has anyone got any prayer requests? And this 13-year-old girl said, can I share something? She said, I want to pray for my friend. My friend isn't a Christian, and I really want us to pray for her. And so they began to pray for this girl's friend. We, the next week came, and they said, Let, should we pray for her again? And then before you know it, week after week, they were praying in this house for the life of the girl for one whole year. They did public prayer together. They stood together. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, verse 19 to 20, it says, again, truly I tell you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And so she stood on that promise and she said, I've, I want us to keep praying because the Bible tells me that where two or three are gathered and we ask for things in Jesus' name, there it is and it's done. And they prayed for a year for the salvation of the girl's friend. And I can tell you today that I am standing as a believer because of the prayers that was prayed because that was my friend at 13 that decided to do public prayer for my life in a house every single week that she stood with her brothers and sisters and I am now a Christian following God, raising my children as Christians because of the result of public prayer. And church, I want to call on us today that we would be a church that is so passionate about public prayer that we do not need to wait until we get to the house of God on a Sunday morning. We don't need to have it where Pastor Claire and Phil tell us about a prayer morning on a Friday morning, though it's fantastic and though I want us to all come to that. You see in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when we read this story, we, we see where people have to travel once a year to the temple because it was there that the presence of God is and it's there that the power is. But if you are a believer in this place this morning, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the presence of God living in you. So wherever you are, you can be a person gathered with your brothers and your sisters and that are standing in prayer together. Oh, let us be a church that on the school run, when your friend tells you about something that they're going through, your first response is to say, we've got to pray for that. Let us be a people that when we go and have brews with each other at their houses, 
and they tell us about something that's going on that we wouldn't click into independent mode and we'd go, let me help. Can I have your children? Can I cook you a meal? Can I do something? And though all that stuff is good and we're going to continue to do that as a church, but let our first thing that comes out of our mouth be to believe in in the power of our words of prayer as warfare. It isn't a running tap. It isn't pointless. It is a weapon in your hand that if we are not praying oh my please lord save us from being a people that are not passionate about public prayer together i want to be part of that church and let me tell you the first person that is corrected by that this week as i've been praying is me too often my friends tell me about things that they're going through and i go to independent mode too often we've got to fight this Christian culture that has come upon us where we're just playing church we are part of a spiritual battle that every single one of us is facing every single one of us in this building this morning needs prayer every single one of us whether you are going through something horrendous or whether you just need your mindset changing on something on the word of God, every single one of us needs prayer. And I pray that this week you would be challenged every single time somebody tells you about something. They're going that your first response, not I'm going to pray for you and go and do private prayer, though that is good and though we'll continue to do that but that we will stand on that verse that where two or three are gathered and when we ask things in Jesus' name, there it is done by our Father and we would stand on that promise. And on that note, it would be so wrong of me this morning to ask us to be a church that believes in public prayer and not give us the opportunity to pray for some very real situations that you are going through. We're going to worship again in just a second. But I just thought, how good would it be if we create a moment before the band get back up where we pray together, where anybody in this building that needs prayer for something can freely, freely respond. People in other countries we've heard this morning are having to do things in secret, but you are free this morning in church to be able to stand with your brothers and sisters and say, I need prayer. I need to continue to persist for this situation that is not changing, but I need you to encourage me. Look what happened at the end of the story. It says, Hannah left and her face was no longer downcast. She actually went back and ate something. She'd not eaten. Maybe you are in this place and you you can't even eat. You're going through something so painful. Well, let us respond this morning and encourage you and pray with our words of warfare into situations. And so if that's you this morning and you want praying for for something, I want you to stand to your feet. I'm stood because I'm stood still persisting for the salvation of my family. Incredible. And then what I want us to do, if you stood around somebody, I want you to do public prayer and I want you to lay hands on the person if they're comfortable. If not, that is completely fine. But I want us to pray into these situations. And if you don't know where to begin, pray the promise of God. Pray the promise of God. I've read to you some promises that what is impossible with man is possible for God. So you just pray that over your brothers and sisters. Whatever they are going through that seems impossible to them, that God would make it possible this morning. And then we're going to worship after that, which is another form of warfare, another form of spiritual battle. But we're going to do that for two minutes. So church, let's not be silent. Let's not be um, but on bold and we'll sit in our seats. But let's be a church that are standing with our family. And we'll go and pray for people this morning.
This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how it may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how it may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm.
Pastor Tina. Just a uh, uh, big thank you really for sharing that. And, uh, We hope you enjoyed that podcast today. Before you go, here's a few ways to keep you connected with us. You can subscribe to this podcast and get all the latest episodes in your feed. Or why not head over to kingschurchlife.com to see what's coming up in the life of our church.